Chasing after a rush is something most addicts are familiar with when it comes to substance abuse. But there's another type of addiction that's devastating the lives of families. MTN's Marcus Boyer gives us a closer look at the impact of gambling addiction. Close to 100 casinos in the area, and sports betting soon making its way into the fold. Gambling addiction is an underlying issue that's affecting people. Just look at the casinos. You never see them empty. There's always cars in the parking lot. Just in terms of our patients, so I have four active gamblers on my caseload right now. And they range from the person who, yeah, they gamble more than they should. Sometimes they're a little short on rent, but eh. Versus I've also got some who lose everything. I've had ones that have lost their entire retirement. They've drained their kid's college fund. You know, when I was a kid, my parents were able to send me to public school. They didn't have to worry about me going to school, getting shot, nothing crazy like that at all. However, things are more dangerous nowadays, and I'm forced to spend serious money keeping my three kids away from the wrong elements. Listen, this story is about my dog man encounter, but you gotta understand, I made a mistake that led to another mistake that led to money being short and walked me right into that dog man encounter. I'm going to be real with you. I love to go to the casino. Poker is my game. I am not a gambler. I have won poker tournaments. I am what you will call a semi-professional poker player. For me, playing poker is an additional income stream. So, here's the scene. I'm down at the casino. I'm playing poker. And I take the worst bad beat you could ever imagine. The hand starts off. I have pocket rockets. I raised the pot by $500 to move all of the people with the trash hands out of the way. The flop comes. Ace, jack, nine. I'm thinking to myself, okay, I'm going to raise $1,000, signaling to these guys that clearly I have trip aces. They should fold and I win this pot. That's all I wanted to do. So I raised $1,000. I'm thinking... I'm going to pick this pot up easy, right? Hell no. Two guys at the table make a call. So now I'm like, all right, if this turn is dead, I'm all in. I'm going to run these dudes out. I'm taking all this money. The turn comes and it's a seven. Hell yeah. I'm winning this hand, right? Now I'm all in $4,500 in the pot. One of the guys fold. I'm reaching for the money, expecting that the other guy's going to fold. And this goes all in and stands up. Now, if you've ever played poker, you know it's only one hand that this dude could have that would make him believe that he could win, and that's pocket jacks. I say to myself, you got to be kidding me. You think that pocket jacks are going to beat pocket aces? No freaking way. Well, when that river hits, guess what? The dude catches another jack. He's got four jacks. Wipes me completely out. I leave the casino pissed off, get back home, sit down, have a beer, and then come to my senses and realize, okay, I'm really about to be short some money. So I go over to the safe, open it up, and realize I'm two grand short on my kid's tuition. Now, pause right here and let me explain something to you about Catholic schools and tuition. You see, a couple of years ago when I was late on one of my daughter's tuitions, I could call up the school and be like, yo, I need like another week or two and I'm going to get this money back to you. But no, 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 no. They use this called smart tuition. Automated system, auto drafts. You can't call and talk to them people about getting no damn extensions. None of that. The whole personal touch is gone. The school has outsourced the collection to this company now in the back of my mind i know i got to come up with this two grand so i'm out the door hustling trying to come up with money these schools will embarrass the out of your child they will take your child out of class and make them sit in the office holding your emotions and your kids emotions hostage over this money taking your child's emotions forging a sword lighting that sword on fire and then thrusting it straight into your heart making you realize that you are a up for not having this money i'm telling you this from experience so i know in the back of my mind i got to get out here and get this money i got about two weeks left before this whole situation explodes 
During the first day, I was really confident. By the third day, I was starting to lose confidence that I was going to be able to come up with this money. By the fifth day, I realized I ain't about to have this money. So I called a school trying to talk to them. They'll tell them, listen, I'm having issues with my job with the whole COVID thing. And they're not trying to hear none of that sob story. And then on top of that, the woman who works in the finance office has that old school phone operator voice. She sounds like she's talking with a nose pin. And she says, Mr. Egger, we understand that times are difficult, but we expect tuition to be paid on time. So now I'm calling family, trying to get the money. But you know how family can be. They asking me if I gambled away my kids' tuition money, telling me I got a gambling problem, when they know that I have won hundreds of thousands of dollars in poker tournaments. That does not mean I have a gambling problem. Finally, I done called all my family members, and my cousin Sandy calls me back and says, listen, he needs some help doing some night shrimping. His big boat with the gigantic nets was out for repair, and he had an order for a thousand pounds of shrimp that he had to fill over the next two weeks. He says, if you come out with me at night, help me shine a light and catch up some shrimp over the next week and a half, I'll pay you $2,500. So now I'm going shrimping. First night out there, it takes us a little while to get on top of these shrimp, but eventually we pull in about 80 to 90 pounds of shrimp. That's a hell of a long way to go to get to a thousand pounds and we're shrimping the old school way. Lights on around the boat, scooping them up with nets. The second night, we go to another area. At this time, we start moving around these groves and in and out of these canals and coves. Some real creepy, sh imagine a scene. We got the lights on. We're anchored at the entrance to this canal. Shrimp are flooding in our direction from deeper in the canal. And the two of us are just there scooping them up when suddenly you can tell something was going on under the water because the shrimp, the fish, all kinds of aquatic life come flying by. You can see them because the water is lit up and they are literally zooming past this boat. Now, I spent my fair share of time in the swamp, so now I'm thinking, okay, maybe we got a giant catfish in the water or possibly, worst case scenario, an alligator. Now, with your permission, allow me to slow down and calm down a little bit and just repaint this picture for you because what happened next is absolutely insane. Remember, we're at the mouth of a canal connected to a larger body of water. We're anchored with the front of our boat in the entrance to that canal. The lights are on on the front of the boat and alongside of the boat. At the back of the boat, it's pitch black. And when you're doing this kind of work, looking down into that water, into those lights, when you turn around and try and peek into the darkness, it's with your eyes because they have to adjust. Okay, so now you fully understand the situation. Here's what happened. I'm there leaning over the front of the boat, net in hand, scooping shrimp up out of the water. When, like I said, everything in the water starts to panic. Then the both of us see this hairy mass swimming under the water in the light. Then it goes under the boat. Now, I had never seen anything like this, but clearly my cousin, had a clue as to what the hell was going on because he starts to scream, grab the anchor, grab the anchor. I'm still down on one knee trying to figure out what the hell we just saw. He's running to the back of the boat, cranking it up. Now I'm pulling the anchor line and I swear it's stuck. Then the anchor line which I'm holding begins to move, pulling me towards the front tip of the boat talk about being scared out of your mind i let it go and now we're being pulled into this canal sandy throws that engine all the way in reverse now the front of the boat is dipping down and we're being drugged down this canal listen to me when i say this to you i ain't no punk but i ain't no tough guy now, i've been in the swamps like i told you before and i'm gonna put it to you as simple and as plain as i can i felt like we we're at the beginning of the end of our lives. Deep down in my bones, down in my soul, every molecule of my body told me that I was in mortal danger. Something was about to eat me and I did not know what it was. That's when Sandy starts to scream. And like I told you before, I'm not a tough guy, 
but Sandy Shoulder is what you would consider a tough guy. But he sounds like a freaking little girl at the back of the boat. Now I'm shifting my focus back to that anchor line which has been ripped out of my hands. And the next thing you know, I see Sandy's body flying through the air, knocking over coolers, landing sideways on the front of the boat, rolling down to his belly, pulling his knife out of his pocket, and trying to cut the anchor line. Now, I need you to understand exactly what the hell is going on. He's there cutting the anchor line. The front tip of the boat is now dipping into the water. The engine is in full reverse. And when that line is cut, the front of the boat pops up into the air. He goes flying into the air, and this turns into Spider-Man. To this day, I can't tell you how he did this, but he's floating up in the air. I watch him spread his legs, looking at where he's going to land. One of his feet land on the boat before the other one, and somehow he pushes off while a portion of his body is still in the air and darts to the back end of that boat and steers us out of there. Remember, we are now moving backwards. He spins the wheel, throws the engine in forward, then turns on the spotlights. And that's when I realized why he was screaming like a little girl, because back there where we had just came from, a solid 75, 80 yards away, you see these huge red eyes in one of the oak trees. Listen to me when I say to you, we were shook up and we were doing stupid sh- Sandy's got this boat wide open, flying through the swamps at night. Some shoot absolutely never do. And he didn't say a word to me until we got back to the dock. Now, sitting there at the dock, Sandy running his fingers through his hair. You can see the stress on his face. And he says, man, I know what the hell we just saw and what we just went through. But dude, we got to get back out there and get some shrimp. Let's just go to another area. Nowhere near there. But we got to get out here and we got to fill this order for these shrimp. So the two of us take 30 minutes to get our heads in order. Then we go back out there and get another 80 pounds of shrimp. I can't explain to you why we did this. But while we were shrimping, we really didn't talk about it much. He just said, I really can't explain to you why we did this. But while we were shrimping really didn't talk much about what happened he just said man we got to be the two most unlucky people in the world all this swamp around here and we picked the canal with two rougarous over the next couple of days we caught 450 pounds of shrimp the old school way then he got his big boat back and we went out and got the rest of the order now for those of you listening to the story this is my very first time telling it And I know what you're thinking. So you went through all that. Did you pay the tuition? Absolutely. Yes, I did pay my kids tuition. And to this day, I still help my cousin on the shrimp boat whenever he needs me. But one thing we ain't doing is going nowhere near the area where them Rougarous were. 